So now we want to talk about how to actually represent forces. And this goes back to the idea that forces are vectors. So we're going to be drawing our forces as a vector. Now, by now, you have lots of practice with vectors, but it's important to remember some of the basics so that you don't start making uh, mistakes now that we're using forces as vectors. So the first thing is that we're going to be talking about our object using our particle model. So we don't actually care if the object is necessarily a box, a big box, a little box, a green box, a red ball, a couch, so on. We're just going to draw it as a particle, i.e. a dot, or a circle big enough to tell that it's there. Later on, when we talk about objects rotating, we will extend this a little bit, but right now our object is just a dot. So now we need to draw our vector. And the big thing is to always keep the tail of the force vector on the particle. That's regardless of whether it's a push or a pull. The tail of the force vector goes at the particle, and then you choose the magnitude and direction appropriately based on what the force is. Now, obviously here, there's no label telling you whether this is two newtons or three newtons. Newtons are the units of force. Um, but we might be drawing multiple force vectors on this one particle, which then makes a free body diagram. And at that point, you want the relative strength of those forces if you have any idea about what they are. So the most important thing here is to have the tail of the vector at our object. Now, the last thing, you should label your force. Again, we're typically going to have multiple forces acting on one particle at a time because that's more challenging than one force at a time, so we'll move very quickly through one force. And so you want to label what force you're talking about. Because this is a vector, in general, your label should have that little vector symbol above it. And F is what we use in general for forces, but we will be introducing notation for many of the different types of forces. And it's just much more clear if this is, say, a spring force or a gravity force if you use a subscript that implies that rather than calling it F1, F2, F3. That's less clear. So again, make the, the vector start at the object and point away, regardless if it's a push or a pull. So now let's talk a little bit about directions. And in doing so, the hope is to return to all of these ideas about what forces are. So we're going to have an agent, we're going to have an object, and the force we can identify as typically a contact force or a long-range force. So in this case, the object we're talking about is the box. Notice that the point here is even labeled box. And in this case, the force we're concerned with is the pulling force of the rope. So since this person is pulling on the rope, as you might know how ropes work, the rope is going to pull the box to the right. It's not, since notice that the rope is very straight, it's not going to pull up or it's not going to pull down. It's pulling exactly in the direction of the rope. And what we'll talk about next with the types of forces is that this is a tension force. So we would say that the direction is to the right. And in this case, it's being labeled with words, but you could use a subscript of maybe like F, uh, that was bad, for maybe rope, right? That would be, that would be fine. Um, and again, our object here was the box. Now, one thing to think about is that box probably has gravity acting on it too, uh, but we haven't labeled that here. So eventually we would think about all of the forces, but right now we're not. We're thinking about one force at a time. Now, in this situation, we're thinking about a spring, and this spring is actually compressed right now, right? So if you compress the spring, it's then going to push out. So it's pushing away from the wall. So the spring needs something to push on, but the spring is now the agent, the box is still the object, and our force here, we could say force spring, it's pushing away. So spring forces are actually fairly complicated, so we're not going to talk about them quantitatively right now, but you should have some sense of how a spring works in terms of being stretched or compressed. Next, we have gravity. Earth is the agent. We would call the cause of the force gravity, but Earth is actually the agent. And so we have the gravitational force, which pulls straight down. 
Again, note that our object is the box. We've labeled that. Now the last thing here is moving away from this. Now in this case we have two forces. We have a top view. So if I wanted to do this, I might label this one. I might label this two. I then draw my object as a point particle. And then I'm going to draw one force, my rope pulling force in that direction, my rope pulling force. And in this case, I'm using one and two because I've labeled the ropes one and two. You could choose A and B. You could give those people names if you wanted, whatever. Um, and so this is how that ends up looking like. Again, now there's two forces because there's two people pulling, but each one goes in the direction. If I knew which one was pulling stronger, I would make that force bigger than the other one. Um, so hopefully this is clear. The direction matters. And again, we always have it start at our dot, our particle model for the object, and go away. We are now to the magic of net forces. So net is a fancy word for total, or you could say sum. And there's two ways that we can write this in general. One is this fancy summation notation. And depending on how much math you have, this might be very clear to you, or it might be intimidating. Uh, if it's intimidating, don't worry. The idea is that you want to take all of your forces, no matter how many there are, and add them up. So in this case, we say that there are n different forces, right? Different forces. But in this case, they're on the same object. And this is really important. You might have multiple objects going on in your picture, but we need to only calculate the net force on one object, right? So this is on one object. But now we're considering many different forces with our n different forces. So one way of writing it, summation from 1 to n, here we're using number subscripts, but again, it's more helpful if you use subscripts that really name the forces. Or you can just write it this way, where you say, hey, start at 1, add 2, keep going until you get to the last one. So add up all of the forces. That's all this means. In general, F net is going to be something that you should be writing a lot. Using F sub n could work, except that sometimes that means normal force. The book uses a different notation so that it's really clear what the difference is, but I would encourage you to always write F sub net. So now let's go back to that same picture I showed you before. So we have our object, which is the box, and we have two forces pulling in their varying directions. We would then need to do vector addition, right? These are all vectors, so this is a vector addition problem. And again, hopefully by now you're fairly comfortable with that. If not, I really encourage you to go back and watch some of those vector videos since it's super important now. So let's look at this picture down here. I have F1 and I have F2, and now I want to make F net, which is F1 plus F2. Well, how can we do this? So remember that you can move a vector without actually changing anything about it. So I can leave F1 in place, move F2 to its tip, and there you go. Now you see that F1 plus F2 gives you F net. So creating this F net is going to be a big part of what we do when we're working with forces. Now really quick, uh, something that comes up when we talk about the net force is the idea of superposition. And it's this fancy physics word that actually simplifies down really nicely. So superposition just means that you can add things together. If you look it up at Wikipedia, it's going to look crazy complicated, but it really just means that you can sum up the pieces, that nothing is interacting between the pieces. And so I was trying to think of some examples of what would be superposition and what would not be superposition that doesn't come from physics. Because the good news is in physics, almost everything obeys superposition, which means that you can just add it up. So one example is, say, measuring the weight of five bananas. You know that you can put all five bananas on the scale and measure their weight, or you can measure each one individually and then add those numbers up. That's kind of the idea of superposition. Um, and it's kind of still a physics example. 
So it was really hard for me to come up with a non-superposition example, and mostly I had to think about things that are very much not physics. So the best one I came up with is the idea of putting a bunch of rabbits together. That if I have some nice fluffy bunnies and I put them in a room that is of course well stocked with food and water and whatever their little rabbit hearts may desire, and I come back a few months later, I'm going to have more rabbits. Those rabbits interact. Again, not a physics example because physics things typically obey superposition, uh, but if you see that word, it just means really add things together.